So, um, Tanakato, everyone, welcome to um, the Cape, Cape Woodland Capacity Builder Project uh, webinar series. This is the um, fourth webinar in the series, but the second webinar um, looking at hill country erosion, which is probably fairly pertinent at the moment. Um, firstly, um, apologies that there was short notice on this. Um, as, as you can understand, um, very lucky to have the pre present presenters here, but they have now obviously been dealing with Cyclone Gabrielle as well. So um, there'll be some good insights um, into that as well. So as before, um, you're all on mute, um, but a real encouragement for questions for you to ask them in the Q&A session. So we can see those questions and then you can like them um, in terms of importance. And what we'll try and do is answer the question that relates to a certain picture before we move on to the next one. So what we'll do, we'll work through the process for the next three quarters of an hour and we'll see how far we get with the presentation. Um, and I'm sure we could uh, twist Kerry and Co's arm um, to come back in if we need to to um, discuss again. So I'd just like to introduce the presenters. So um, Kerry Hudson, most of you know Kerry, um, has been had an involvement in Enzyme, um and in the industry since 1982. Um, and has filled a number of roles in terms of land management, um, water resources, coastal discharges, and regional planning with, um, in the Gisborne district. Um, in terms of his time with Enzyme, so he's been on the executive since 2014 and was a president between 2017 and 20. Now, putting together this presentation, he's also had the help of Enrique Perez. Um, he's a land ma manager. At, at Disney, um, at sorry, at um, Dis, um, Gisborne District Council, and that's enabled to um, exposure to different topics from land use capability, um, GIS, um, surveying, nutrient management, and farm planning to forestry. Um, Enrique um, was originally an agronomist with um, in Mexico, um, and has come to uh, come to New Zealand via uh, Melbourne um, in Australia. So he's got a real rounded base on some of his skill sets and also not presenting today but as involved is Bryce um, McLaughlin um, who began work in the East Cape um, with the East Cape Catchment Board in 1980 um, spent his time um, over there most notably in the uh, Waiho Moco um, catchment catchment control scheme before leaving to go to um, Bahrain for a number of years, which I think would probably be another story there. And now he's re returned to Gisborne Council as a land management officer. So as you can see, we've got plenty of skill sets to talk through some of these pictures. And they, there's going to be some pictures on what's just recently happened as well and a bit of discussion as to how the mitigation controls around hill country erosion have been have held up in, in, in with some of the extreme weathers that we've had recently. So we'll move into the, the um, webinars. So um, please put your questions forward and we'll keep going um, until the time slots up and then we'll see what we've got left and probably um, look to have another session. So um, over to you, Kerry and Co. Yeah, thanks very much, Adrian. And um, yeah, welcome to what is sunny Gisborne at the moment. So we've had all our summer so far, all in the last 10, 15 days. Um, initially in the month of January, uh, the rip had received an average of an inch rainfall a day. And we've had Cyclone Gabriel since then. So they'd be right up at um, probably double that, probably still averaging um, and it's a day up until the end of February. Uh, so we've we just got six or seven photos from Cyclone Gabrielle. The first one here, if everyone can see it, is um, Slash and the a, a tributary of a catchment that flows through Gisborne City. So we've regularly had Slash out of here. Ironically, the forest at the head of this, there's been no harvesting for about four years now. So this is a legacy material that's still coming. So it's a gift that keeps providing. You can go on. Um, and this is the forest where some of this has come from. So we've got whole trees coming down there. Uh, begs the question why we're planting some land as steep as that, but um, that's some of the things we now have to sort through. So the, those trees are at least five years old. They just have had no chance of holding on in, in the intense rains we've had. Um, <clears throat> this is a dam that formed at the top end of the coast, uh, Wairongamai catchment into the 
uh, Otribu Waiapu. Um, it's burst through now, but it's a slump that came from top to bottom down that hill, and we get these quite regularly in big events. We've had a couple of them in this. That one's just chewing its way through, but it's um, they, are, they you need to keep an eye on them because of how much water they do have behind them. So you've probably heard the access to Tokamara Bay. So this is on the northern side of Tokamara Bay. That slump came out. So there's a gully there that's been active. We've been unable to get too much vegetation in it. And trees here that are predominantly about 10 years old all collapsed and <clears throat> blocked the gorge. The thing to note in there, Acacia melanoxin in the middle bottom part of the screen here has done remarkably well. We've lost certainly lost some on the sides of that, but um, there's something in that that Acacia has performed pretty well in this. It is on easier land. This is the opposite view from the helicopter. So we're looking down the road towards Tokamara Bay. Where you can see the water there is actually where the road was. And the material out to the right of that is in the old bed of the creek. There's a big sheet pile between them. The road used to be on top of the sheet pile wall. It's now the flow of the river. And um, so all that material is backed up on the sheet pile, pushed it over into the onto the road so it's not not damming up as much again now but uh, quite a threat towards Tokamara Bay while this event was on and um, oh, these are the Hikamai bridges and not that clear but so this is the first bridge is the one that's down uh, ironically the fibre optic cable still going across that that's still working but it's not working on the second bridge that is still intact so major problem there and one of the big issues with that bridge is even when they get a replacement valley bridge in place, it's so hard to put it in place with the soft nature of the banks on both sides. That's, that's really soft material. And then finally, this, that slash at Tolliga Bay, um, there's a few wheelbarrows in that lot. It's, it's several hundred metres long and it's um, predominantly legacy type wood from that's been filled some time ago, although we are getting a mixture of material of... Um, old trees we've seen areas where we've had 25 30 year old trees the whole hill claps and a lot of it's ended up in the river that's our big problem coming up so that's some photos from gabriel so we'll move in and i'll we'll hand over to um andrique to look at um uh his part of the presentation he's got an interesting photo here yeah it's just a um a property that has um long history of um soil conservation and that's probably on one of our worst affected accidents for um, soil slips on the Hangaroa. Um, actually the top right part is now part of the same farm but it's, it's been added to the farm so that it doesn't have the same history of soil conservation. Uh, it's a mixture of poplar, willow and pine trees actually. So this, this is where we finished off last time. So this, we started off with we, we mapping areas, land use capability, and um, this area here, coast, Pukatiti, Tapuya Springs, and you can see we've got quite a um, badly eroded argillite gully in there, and then areas around it with a lot of plantings on it. So move on from that, we've overlaid that with what is the land use capability mapping. So this is done at a one to 10,000 scale. And you can see we've got some big areas of class six interspersed with some quite badly eroded class seven. And going, we'd only get one or two units on the thing. So that's worked really well for us over a long period of years that we've got. Mapping down to a farm scale, you can see where all the trees are. The piece in the middle, 7019, still, still problematic. Um, but what we've seen in the last little while is unless you've got some control of the gully in there, you have got real problems. And I don't think any any amount of forestry in the head of the catchment there and that tangy white paddock in the middle would have, would have saved the situation. So gully planting has worked in a lot of places, uh, but we've still lost quite a bit of it just through the intensity on very road, eroded land. So moving through from there, this is this is a piece of mapping. You want to talk about it? So this is a piece of mapping that uh, Bryce did a couple of years ago, and it just shows, um, we talked about his sort of map to the green, where you've got um, soil depth, you're getting classes three, four, and some six, and the seven's on the steeper, bonier land that dries out a lot more quickly. So that was um, mapped two years ago in the autumn, and the time of year actually helps no end to, to map that, because those thinner, steeper soils 
have got a lot less vegetation on them. So that's the sort of mapping we've been doing, and we can work really closely with that. We have got the gullies and that they're the critical source areas we should be looking at in um, freshwater farm environment plans. So that mapping serves us very, very well in our region. Um, and this is just an example of uh, another farm where, um, in addition to the LEC mapping, we started using um, a lighter, not just for the slopes and 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 recalibrating the other right one. So um, we're able to, on the top left, you can see we are able to pick all the tree or vegetation, um, and then we are helping farmers. Um, in combination with the LRI to um, so we to calculate the areas not just of um, bush blocks but also scattered trees and then determine what sort of um, vegetation that is with the LRI and in the lack of LRI we can use the LCDB or other layers to um, help with the Hewaka Kenoa if it goes ahead um, to know the numbers and yeah there's been a, a combination of uh, lighter and LUC. Right, so um, some of you would have heard we have land overlay 3A in our region, which is land use capability units with three and worse erosion, and there are requirements in our title fitty plan to establish effective tree cover on that. We're starting to wonder what effective tree cover is in some of our region after the events of the last few weeks. And some of that, we've had whole mature forests plantings move, um, you know, what, what is the answer? We're grappling a bit with it. So this is 3A on one particular piece in land from Tonga Bay on uh, property owned by the council's key shareholder. We've dealt with this with pole planting. Um, really difficult to deal with it on the outside bend of the creek at the bottom, but the rest of it's established quite nicely in poles uh, planted about 2017, 18. Um, they held on quite well in the recent event and uh, I'll get some photos to add into that at some stage when we, we fly a bit closer. So 3A in our district, this one here can be, um, can be dealt with poles. And, and fortunately, what we do have in the bottom end of that is quite a bit of scrub cover that is already quite protective. Um, and poles responded, uh, that land responded quite well to pole planting. It'll be interesting to see what it, what it looks like now. One of the things we have noticed is um, some of the Mature pole plains in our region have held on as well as anything, but they are on better class seven, class six, not not the real tiger stuff. Um, but we've had some real problems in that in terms of forestry and just lack of material in gullies. So moving on here, this is a real interesting site at Tokomara Bay. So Toko has had some really intensive rains in the last two to three years, um, certainly copped it again. This time they had that big slip showed earlier on. Now, I, we got severely criticised for putting this in Poplar and Willow right back in the 80s. And yet when you look at it now, they have a reduced amount of grazing, but they have the paddock still here with not so much erosion. And the neat thing about it is no one ever harvests that. We We haven't done anything in terms of rejuvenating the trees in there. But if on forest land nearby, where we've just recently harvested, we've got quite a bit of erosion. The gullies in here have held on really well. And so looking at it now, perhaps this was a really good idea. We're getting some permanent vegetation on there. There's quite a bit of scrub coming amongst that. And um, we're starting to see that, yeah, that's, that is a very good land use in, in our region. Uh, moving on to, yeah, and not far from there, this is on um, Busby's Hill going down into Tokamara Bay from the top of the hill, and it's um, it's renowned for soil movement. And on here when the State Highway 35 was reformed, and we get this sort of slumping on land that's not that steep. So a lot of water in these slopes. This keeps on moving. And, of course, what the roads uh, what the Katahi are doing all the time is cleaning out the water table and just bringing it down. So need some sort of better support than we've got on that. Um, we're finding likes of flaxes and some species like that do, do quite well on that. We're also interested in what the likes of um, Tagasasti and some species like that do that thrives in this sort of country. But we haven't really been dealing with a lot of that stuff in recent times and certainly need to get back to it. There's a lot of sites where that sort of land 
would respond pretty well to um, sort of shrubs and uh, and species like Tagasasti. We've we've had poplars on some of this, but they actually they've got quite big, and they become an issue with regard to the road later on in terms of if we lose anything that is wind flow wind flow. We've had we are quite vulnerable at the moment to wind throw because the ground's so wet. And we've had quite a few trees come down in different parts of the region in the last few weeks. Um, really good option here. Probably photo doesn't do it justice. This was a site uh, within a forest when the cutting rights were let from the government back about 1984. And um, a forestry company came to us and they were sorting out all the smaller blocks that didn't have plantation species in them. And this one here, we had a lot of poplar and willow in the gully here, and they wanted to plant the edges, and uh, we wouldn't let them, we wouldn't allow burning of it. So they planted acacia melanoxylin through amongst um, the block, and it has responded really well. So acacia melanoxylin, coppicing species, that was a particularly badly eroded paddock. And uh, in terms of soil conservation, that's been a, a real success. And it looked quite good when I flew close to it the other day. Um, and, you know, you know, no one's going to look at harvesting that in a hurry. Focusing species, legume, it's, it's actually done very well. So there's places where that, that is going to be a good option going into the future. And so, yeah, this is a block, uh, Telfrey Paro, Thunland from Polyga Bay and particularly bad and badly eroded land. This photo goes back to Cyclone Boulder, um, and it was farmland then, and you can see all the poplar and willow in the gullies. And if we move on, so they were holding it reasonably well at Boulder, but we had all this erosion around it. So that area is a forested, and you can see the background of this, all those willows showing up in the um, in the gullies. They've done particularly particularly well in there. And when they've harvested this block, um, those willows and poplars in there have held together quite nicely. We've got land immediately next door that didn't have the poplar and willow planting on a neighbouring property, and we've got another cycle of erosion. Some of that. I'll be really interested to see what this looks, uh, looks like after this cyclone because the um, the harvesting is only three or four years ago, so the trees that have been planted on the slopes and amongst the poplar willow there are still fairly young, so they may well have been caught quite badly in, in this event. Uh, but the poplar and willow in there from earlier times has, has been really, really helpful in our region. So moving on from that, um, this is a really interesting spot. So people may have heard, and it's been on, been on television, the properly called Huirua, so it's the back of Tokamara Bay, and... So what do we do with this now? And we were talking with the owners when we put the presentation together last year, and we've looked at it again um, yesterday with them. And what we're looking at here is some plantation species on the on the upper slopes. Some of the eroded slopes there will be in Manuka or possibly uh, some coppicing experiment with the cost and the risk that that's, could be a really... Um, a really expensive process. And then we're looking at a, a, some form of seeding of the real highly eroded gray material in there. Very difficult to get anything in the gullies, but um, you go back 10, 15 years ago, and the push on there would have been for um, plantation species over the whole thing. And it's, we've certainly moved a long way away from that. We're really interested in anyone's alternative ideas on that. It's been purchased by um, Akita, who are really interested in uh, long-term environmental issues, and um, yeah, we, we've, we're finding them really good to deal with so far. And I think they've got the combinations here right, but unfortunately, um, what we do with that real barely eroded grey material, we haven't been able to do a great deal with it all in the past. And some of that stuff, you go in there in recent weeks and through the winter months, you go knee deep in it. And it's it's very active to get anything growing, fast growing species required, but we haven't got anything fast enough to deal with that. So really difficult site. Just a reminder for anyone, if you've got any questions on a specific picture, just put them in the Q and A session, and then um, Carrie and Co can cover them off as we go um, while we're looking at the picture. 
So once again, on the same property and on a different part of that catchment, um, yeah, up until, say, 2010, there would have been no question that uh, and, and this was a push with the incentives in our region that this would have been close planted in uh, P. radiata. They grow quite quickly on it, um, but we have this problem of the harvest cycle coming around every 25 years and also now that whole all mature trees are moving on it. So this is a bit of a dilemma, but what this company is looking at doing is all the crack ground there will go into uh, Manuka. Um, quite a bit of willow right down near the bottom. That probably needs to be delayed a while to try and get some effect on the slopes. And then the upper slopes, and it's certainly not too much of it in here, certainly a piece out to the right in the top part would be in plantation species. They help no end in terms of um, forming a quick canopy and reducing the um, runoff rates onto the slopes below. But overall, we're heading right away from having plantation species all over this. The company may also look at some form of coppicing species on this. They, they have been quite interested in acacia and uh, perhaps you thought this. But the problem will be with that is just propagating enough material. This is really big scale country and um, just getting enough trees or any of those species is going to be really problematic. So um, this is an area of land also in land from Tolliga Bay. It's on land that um, council's a big shareholder in. And the problem here is that this is a real missed opportunity is when these trees were 10, 15 years old, we should have gotten and really close planted the gully in there. No incentive to do it. Um, Perhaps not as high risk in that site. That one there, I think, would respond quite nicely to it. The pine trees have are controlling the runoff as well as they're going to in terms of us being able to establish something on the beer slopes in there. That's an opportunity missed, and that's something into the future we need to incentivise a lot better than we have. There's this real push here at the moment about um, yeah, everything failing, but the, the incentives, and, and we've been... Uh, talking about this right since Cyclone Bola is the incentives need to focus on gullies, waterways, and it's been sort of a forestation of whole slopes and not focusing on the gullies. And we've made this pretty clear over a long period of time, and perhaps we might get somewhere with it now. But once again, uh, it's expensive and it's high risk to deal with those gullies, but it's a matter of plugging away in there, and you might have two or three times you go back and, and blank the gaps. Um, but history has shown that's really the only, only way to deal with it. It's not a, a one-off fix where you just plant the whole thing in you know, plantation species and then that's the end of establishment. Establishment on this country is an ongoing process and with each ensuing heavy rainfall, we have to go back and, and plug the gaps. So that one there we missed. We need to get back to that. Um, not very clear here, but this is a piece we're now getting into reversion really the only option on it. It's certainly not a uh, plantation forestry option, but uh, like anything else we've got here, this is going to really struggle with the intensity of the rains we get to establish anything on that. Um, I've been surprised the amount of regrowth we've had on the better country in here in the time I've been here. So there's a lot of that's come along in the last 40 years. We need to look closely at what can be done on some of the beer slopes there. Monica goes really well on it. We find it on, on uh, slip ground that it does very well. It's just the the high severity we have on some of the some of that there is four slip and then you got four gully in the bottom wood as well. So really difficult to deal with and uh, and really expensive and high risk. Um, this block here was planted in P. radiata immediately before the NDS came in. Now, we would not issue a consent for more than about 20% of that now. It's just um, it's just creating problems. Um, we would get some reversion on it, but those really active sites, that's still our dilemma here. What did we do with those? But um, planting it in pine ra Pinus radiata and expecting to harvest it, as regularly as being the practice up here is, is certainly not the answer. So there's, a, there's some big things going on this. Um, the shame of that is uh, that was uh, had grant assistance from the government in a time when reversion was available 
and um, yeah, a lot of it's been planted in in plantation species. So we're going to, I suspect, we'll have some problems. But um, what we need to do, where people are talking about transitions from plantation species to indigenous, this sort of side here, where we will have some plantation species come along, but we won't want them to get through to maturity. And if we can transition indigenous on this, the big problem, of course, will be getting anything on some of those really erosion prone slopes. Um, same paddock, you can see just, just as bad in here. And you know, the mentality of planting radiata on the slopes in the middle of that is um, with two problems is, a lot of them will just topple off, and the other is how are you going to harvest that? So not not particularly helpful at all. And um, so yeah, that just needs to be left to revert, and we'll get some reversion on it. But um, plantation species on that is not not the answer. So moving through from here, this is a real interesting block. Once again, um, this was a uh, Hui Rua, and. Um, so what do you, what what do we do with this? And and what's happened here is they actually planted the whole thing in Manuka. They had quite a failure in terms of achieving the minimum survival with the um, erosion control funding program. So they then converted it from Manuka to reversion. Um, now the Manuka has been really slow, and we can see that um, it's not going to fix the problem so it's five or six years old now it's this this photo is dated it's showing up better than that at the moment so what we're doing here is we're going to focus on that trying to retain as much in the bad gully and the broken slopes leading up to the um the ridge around the um sort of the the mid slope there will be retained in manuka and some more planted but the upper slopes will go into uh, radiata uh, we can harvest that, but the radiata there will be fast growing and reduce the runoff rates into the gully and onto the slopes below. Um, we see that as, as the best option. There's not much in the way of Manuka growing on the better upper slopes, the competition in there from particularly the grass has been great. So we're we're halfway there with this block, but Manuka on the whole thing was not the answer. It's very slow growing. And actually getting to anything in that gully, we'll only ever get back to that if we get some reasonable Manuka on the on the greener parts of the broken ground, not the grey stuff in the middle, and radiator on the top. We may get an opportunity to establish some willow in the bottom, but it's very high risk, very high cost. So, Kerry, in, in the eyes of the landowner, what was driving those initial decisions? Was it the, the funding that was available, which then drove kind of that land use change and what to change it into? Or was it erosion that was driving that decision? Um, yeah, so, so what drives it there, Adrian, is um, this is all land overlay 3A here. So they were obliged to plant something. Um, that had some issues on other land in here with, with radiata into the river. So they saw Manuka as the option. Bit of inflexibility in the way the east there. Um, now the Manuka has been slow, and you know it's hard to get growing with predators. So it, it's driven very much by the requirement to get some form of effective tree cover on it and uh, finance being available to deal with it. But I think the answer we're getting now is going to be significantly better than what we started off with. Really hard to really hard to achieve minimum density requirements to get paid in those schemes when they're based on a radiata survival, not on an indigenous one. And that turns people off somewhere. But the reversion option, where as long as you're keeping the stock out, you, you're getting compensated for it is a is a backup that these people have taken here. So yeah. So yeah, the, the driver is trying to get some vegetation on it. Um, I criticised we're not putting forestry on this at one part, and yet in a very erosion part of our region, we've quite successfully planted poplar and willow there. It shows our age a bit because those things are pretty dated now. It's older species, some of it. Um, not a great deal of movement in these last events. Easy sloping country, still um, grows a lot of grass, uh, good shade, good shelter. And um, 
yeah, I really wonder where we would have been if we'd have forested it as some of the advice was at the time. Um, certainly did, didn't think that was a great option, and it's proven that this one's actually worked quite nicely. So this is, um, I think I showed in the first presentation, an area where we've promoted uh, radiata on the better land in here. So there's a lot of rough country in here that's been allowed to revert and the better land, and you can see the square box there, a lot of that has been the upper slopes, quite a bit of uh, class six, bit of class seven. And the real tiger country, the bad class seven has been allowed to revert. Now the really interesting thing with this is the gullies in there, if we go on to, if you just picture where the indigenous vegetation's here, if we go on to the next photo, um, that cyclone boulder, you see those gullies were a lot more active then. So the radiata has actually created a situation where we've reduced the runoff, we've got some canopy cover on the top, and that's given those really eroded slopes a far better opportunity to establish um, managed reversion in indigenous species on the last slope. So it held on okay in this last event. I flew over it the other day. We've got two slips that um, go from the river to about 100 metres up the slopes and parts of it. But this is big scale stuff. And overall, we've considered this a bit of a success story because at the time we thought it's going to be difficult to deal with. Um, there was a move to plant a whole lot in radiata, and I think we would have had a fair heap of that right down in the riverbed this time around. So the indigenous has held on really well on the lower slopes. We just go back one, uh, Enrico. Yes, yeah, uh, and those, those gullies, other than one or two of them, have closed right up. So that is that is a good option. And we're going to get reasonable quality wood off there. They're going to have to harvest that in fairly small areas at a time to not do too much damage. But it's a long way from town, so what you put on the back of the truck, you want to be of some value. And the stuff we've got in radiata there is quite high value. So... This we've seen is quite a success story and it has held on reasonably well in this last event, so yeah, quite pleasing. So if we move through, um, oh, there it is. So that's one against the other. The box in the middle shows, you know, just how bad that erosion was and how much the radiata has done the trick there. But the big gullies below it have um, have reverted quite nicely. We we did have radiata right down to the creek and places and there on what was considered reasonably stable country. It hasn't moved too much. And so, you know, we still consider this as um, quite a success story. So moving on from there, um, now this is the access to Mount Hikarangi. So coming in from the left-hand side is Tapawairaw Valley Road. And it crosses what's called the Rip Stream coming in from the bottom and then the, um, the Oranui from the uh, right. So you can see there the buildings are on flats in the riverbed. This is 1957. And they were reasonably well protected by a big long line of uh, willow alongside the Tapawairo River. Um, we've got four photos here. They're in a time sequence and then we'll, we'll join a series of them together. But... The thing to look at in here is the piece inside the blue box is 57. Just how much that changes in time since then. So we move on to the next one, which is 1998. So that's 10 years after the cyclone boulder. And you can see the buildings here are in the riverbed. So that was a plug of material that had taken it 10 years to get through there. Uh, a few months prior to this photo, that was green paddocks around where the wool shed, the white cross in there, and those other buildings. The willow trees we'd planted in the previous photo are, are gone. The riverbed's twice as wide as it was. And these guys have had to relocate out to the right of those flats and, and build a new house there. The wool shed was uh, relocated right to the top of the hill. So when we go to the next photo here, this is another... So another 20 years on from the last one, you can see the walls get up the top and you've got no record at all in the riverbed of where the wall shed was. So you know, this has happened reasonably quickly and I couldn't get over in 1994, we had a wall shed with paddock yards around it, all pasture. We had a rainfall there, we've got shingle in the yards. We then got 
shingle halfway up the side of the water and never got it inside it. It happened remarkably quickly. Um, and you can see from that just how wide our riverbeds got. So what we do with that is really difficult. The, the best thing that we can try and deal with is deal with the feral animals in the upper catchment. A lot of the sediment comes from um, the dock estate. And that, came, that resulted from big rains in uh, 1982, 1988. Um, and taking quite a bit of shingle out of the riverbed too. And although shingle extraction here is um, making such a minimal effect. So moving on, we join all these together. So you can see the top, the blue boxes, the top left hand there, it's all alluvial flats quite high above the river. We go along the top again, and we've got some material in amongst the yards. Then we've got um, those yards and that well and true wool shed's got material around it. And then you, there's no semblance or of anything in the um, in the bottom right hand. The other thing to notice here from the top left hand photo, how wide the riverbed is, and if you look in the bottom one, it's twice the width. And so it gets out on the road. The road used to be quite nicely protected back in 1957, even 1988. But now you can see in the bottom left hand, bottom right hand there, it's impinging right on the road. It's actually captured it a bit. The bridge uh, right in the bottom there, you can see that's that was a bridge built 1994. Um, it had two um, cross members, cro cross members from the river up to the base of the bridge. We're now about 90% up the height. It was about 20 feet above the riverbed. It's now um, up to within two or three feet from the base of the bridge. So that's happened really quick. That's the second bridge that's been there in my career. And we're about to have to lift it again, I think. So that's how dynamic it is in all the planting in the world. Doesn't do a great feel for that. And a lot of the trees that we have on the banks here are being captured by the river as it builds up. And that's what a lot of our, it's not slash, it's whole trees ending up at the mouth of the Waipu. And where does all this come from? And there's native wood, poplars, willows, acacia, pine trees, there's everything. And so as that river builds up, that problem is going to accentuate. Nothing too much we can do with it. We go on from there. This is a really interesting site, also in land from Ruatoria, area called uh, Mangafariki. Really difficult to deal with because we've got eight land titles here, all on straight line boundaries, um, all with different owners. Some want to do something, some don't. So the guys who don't dominate, everything goes. 1957, it was pretty bare. It just shows you uh, the clearance we'd done on the East Coast. 1988 Cyclone Bowler, the middle photo there, didn't actually look too bad. Um, the erosion had deteriorated somewhat, but it was not as bad you, as you might have thought. Not a great deal of regrowth, but the photo over to the right shows, in spite of grazing, grazing with cattle, no control of feral animals too much, how much reversion we had. And to me, just ongoing reversion in that, there's a seed source there. We, we ran into problems where the agency was wanting to uh, require planting of indigenous species in there. And I just think the reversion would have been the best option. So we could have got stock removal and amazing amount of reversion on active land between 1988 and 2019. We've still got those dirty gullies, but it's amazing how much they do close up over time. I'm not really looking forward to seeing this since the events of um, this year so far, but um, reversion in the long term is really the answer for this. And yeah, there we are, the 2019, just zooming in a little. You can see how active those gullies are. When the um, incentives came through from MPI, this was earmarked as a site that was just screaming out for Pinus radiata. Uh, right now, if we had the forestation application come in for this, we'd be avoiding those uh, big gullies, allowing them to revert, and we might have a limited amount on the better country out on the left-hand side. And I don't think there's sufficient land on the right-hand side up out of the gully in between those gullies to have any reasonable area of plantation species on it. So um, 
certainly yeah. moving right away and getting something, some form of permanent vegetation. The other thing to take into account here in terms of reversion, this is almost rainforest for climate. So we get um, a very, uh, pretty sure, year-round rainfall, really good. And um, so growing vegetation on that is um, pretty conducive in that climate. The issues we have are the, the grazing, the ferals, but also the erosion. So it, it does come back and it's surprising how quickly it does come back if we, we eliminate the grazing and feral animals. So moving on from there. Um, yeah, so the, here's, here's a site. Um, Council planted this block. I remember planting this 1984. Um, and I'm walking around in here doing the harvest consent and find there hasn't been a chainsaw in here. The whole hill's collapsed. You can see how easy sloping that is. So, you know, when we're looking now, are we going to base anything on replants and that on slope? It's only one factor. So these are, you know, the um, NZLRI slopes, these are strongly rolling to moderately steep, so Ds and Es. The, the problem here is the gully in the bottom is very hard based and we had an attempt to plant willow in there. Not that successful just because of the hard nature of it. So ideally it probably needs some form of structural support in there, which is going to be really expensive. So establishing dams in that and that area is going to be slow, long process. Um, probably you know, too high a risk. So um, it just shows we've got what we thought was a good option, 1984. This thing had worked quite nicely for um, 20, 25 years. Harvest time comes along and the whole thing's collapsed. So what we do with that, um, we have seen some promising results with the likes of the case of melanopsin on that at Amanga 2. But once again, you get into the situation where radiata has been successful for a time. The um, pest control is a lot easier than other species. That's alternative species like acacia, the pest control needs to be significantly improved. So we're back to the drawing board on some of this, what, what we actually do with it. Um, and even reversion, with quite surprising how much manuka comes away. Always surprised how manuka comes away on what is quite quick one week round. So um, you'd be interested to see how that that one works. That works out at a time. But we are struggling with what do you um, what do you plant in there after harvesting? And uh, once again, this one here. So what, what's happening? This property here we've got a situation where it's very difficult to establish a fence from the gully up to the ridge um, you're forever repairing fences there people have tried electrics are forever made from them so what we've got to here and it's going to take time but this landowner is now not putting fertilizer on the bottom part of the slope they're certainly not cutting any scrub they're establishing popper and water over time we're getting quite a bit of regrowth on that i don't know what it looks like after the last event. The upper slope they've left in farming, um, the alternatives, total forestation and uh, difficult block to get at in terms of access and how do we deal with the harvest cycle in the year. So if we can promote that vegetation by not putting fertiliser on and having water at the top of the passing amount of stuff that may go down through that. But this is a long slow slog to get this, this piece sorted out. Um, this is a photo I showed at the um, masterclass in uh, Wellington where we've got gully erosion. Uh, in my first year here, 1982, we planted that paddock in Willow, including the badly eroded gully. Now, what this shows is Willows work very well on slight to moderate erosion and in the active gully in there, which is severe to very severe, they have not held on. So in the in the photo in the top right hand corner, there's a like a log line down in the fore in the in the distance. That's actually a power pole that's toppled in there. So the power came across there. That's how active this land is. So what that photo demonstrated to me when we looked at that, you need something more in that gully. We've put about 20 sediment dams in there to date. I haven't seen them since Gabriel. Um, they were they were incredibly successful up until then in a really active site. We were 
in the where we used to put in sequences of um, sediment debris dams of say putting one in in the early spring after planting season and hoping it will fill up before the autumn. And this side here, we've been putting them in every couple of months because they're filling up so quick. Uh, we kept a lot of material in there and it, it'll be really interesting to see how they've gone. So the dams have gone in there and we've had uh, willows established in them and that is going to be the best way to get on top of that gully. We could have some success with just trying to replant poles in there, but history would suggest to us that over time, it's just too active a site to expect poplar and willow poles alone to, to deal with it. So we, we have a good alternative there. Um, just what effect these really big rainfall events has on it is, is you know, we, have, we haven't been back to it yet. So moving Carrie, through. Kerry, just yeah. for that one, how big's the catchment area? Because you know, you, you've talked about how dams are filling not really quick, quick but from what I'm seeing, yeah. how no, it's, is it? Uh, so, if, so, so, so I mentioned that, Adrian. That's only about 10 or 12 hectares. Blimey. It's not that big, but you would be surprised how much water ends up in that gully. So uh, high rainfall area and... Um, yeah, it's, it's quite incredible how much water comes down there. If it was too much larger, we the dams would be uh, just overwhelmed with flow and the amount of debris coming down. So, yeah, they, they work in places. They're only a, a real niche. Um, and this is one site where it's, it's worked really well. We used to rely on the fact that you think they were going to fill up over the spring, summer and autumn with, with regular rainfall. We've had them this year where we put one in on a Monday and it's full on a Tuesday morning um, with the heavy intensive rainfall. But I think we're getting it to a stage where we, we are capturing a lot of sediment in them. They do work, but they're expensive. They're high risk in the environment we're living in at the moment with the regular rainfalls. And you get onto too big a catchments, there's just too much water coming down. They're overwhelmed. Um, now, this is something we felt we got right. Um, so this is a property, Mangaterrada, on the Mata Road. And you'll see in here, the blue lines are land overlay 3A. So we basically established all the land overlay 3A in plantation trees. Now, one thing we have found in the bottom of that photo, there's some land overlay 3A with quite big gaps in it. Those trees there have collapsed into the river. They've created a dam that's it burst and probably the material that's come from that has been part of uh, material that's come down and captured a bridge. So we need to be really careful what of that 3A we put in plantation species, what we allow to revert. And certainly while the basic concept in there I think was correct, there was too much of the really steep stuff that went into trees. Um, if we look in the blue square in here, you can notice the gully's shaped there. And if we go to the next photo, that's a blow up of that. So to me, this was highly successful planting on better country up out of the really badly eroded stuff. So poplars, willows, have done particularly well. No real erosion up in there anymore. It's on better class seven, grading into some six. So we, are, we now have the whole thing, uh, plantation species. And um, quite disappointing to see what was hanging on quite nicely as a farm now, total forest. So we went from about 5,500 acres there, it's at 2,000 hectares. We've gone from that where about a third of it was forestry and the rest was farming. We've now 100% forestry. Same here. I think we got the mix quite right in here. You can see where poplars and willows have done the trick on the better country. And uh, forestry has done okay on that, but we need to be really careful inside the blue lines. You can see some areas there that haven't have forested that well, whether we should have put radiata on them or just allowed it to revert in time is a question. So we're really interested to go back and see what we've, what we've had happen there. Um, harvesting on what's really steep banded mudstones in, in our region, we would have some big exclusions on this since the NES came in. So, for instance, that 
in the middle of the photo out to the left, there's quite a big basin there, double gully that we wouldn't allow to be harvested, uh, to be planted. Um, you can see the trees in the bottom, mature trees, they were just too difficult to get out. They've been more or less been abandoned. And so a uh, real legacy issue coming up with that. But this was the concept at the time. They planted right down to the water's edge. A lot of this in here would um, not get through the forestation process under the NES. But we also need some further tightening up on that. We get here toppling on uh, earth flows, which is you know, quite easy country that's here. It's um, perhaps a D slope, so strong, strongly rolling, but it's wet. And the radiata roots under the ground there go down to about 18 inches where it gets too wet beyond that. And these things, the land moves or they blow over and um, they are not the answer on it. So really difficult to know what is. Once again, reversion with Monica is, is perhaps working as well as anything and perhaps one or two focusing species with... Um, which will tolerate some of the wetter conditions we have here, maybe a better option. But this one here, everything went into radiata and sort of under incentive schemes from right back in the 80s, and it's not working out that well um, and doesn't hold on because of the lack of rooting depth into the soil profile because of the wet conditions. So, um, yeah, we've got a lot to learn on that, but the alternatives to that are really expensive and, and high risk. So... Um, a lot of thinking to go into to how we try and deal with that. Um, yeah, here, we, here we've got uh, their enthusiasm to forest the whole of this property here. They forested a whole lot of Class 8. They now have the problem they, that's been harvested as much as they can harvest. And we've got all these trees left there that are now one by one just falling into the river. Um, we suggested to MPI perhaps these things should be um, desiccated, sprayed out, and then the wildings dealt with. Um, couldn't get much traction on that. And so this landowner here has a real dilemma of what happens with, into the future. And uh, this is one of the concerns with the likes of permanent carbon, but it's the same with plantation areas if we get the Tree, if we get trees in the wrong place, you go through a, a forestation consent now, there'd be a huge part of this would not would not get planted. Um, and so we have this legacy issue now and we'll get slashed from this for some time to come and what to do with it is is still a real problem. So Sorry, that was, uh, got... Yep. Sorry, Carol, I was, was going to say we've got five minutes left, yep. so I just want to re... Um... Just allow a bit of time for questions and then yep. um, as before if you've still got more slides i think we could um look to come back later on to yep. um for another session and it'd be great to include some of those after slides you know you you've commented on a number of sites where you're not looking forward to going back we'd actually yes, love, to see the, <laughs> love to see the results of those yep. those where you've already got the three or four slides to say well, what does slide number five yeah, that's look right. like since Gabrielle. Yeah. So um yeah, so just an opportunity, just any questions, just put up in the QA. Um just just for um carrying on Enrique um on anything that you've seen or anything you'd like them to cover off um next time. Yeah. So we've just got one or two, I haven't got that many more to go actually, but um if we just have a look. Yeah, this is a really interesting site when when um, land over A3A rules first came in here uh, about 2007, the only option on this place inside the blue squares was a forestation. No incentives for anything else. And thankfully, we had reversion come along. And that's been, you know, this is really difficult land. And we've got a couple of photos following it. But the last thing in the world needed to happen on that was plantation species. So this is reversion. It's a slow, hard process. Of Some of it's been quite badly damaged. I have flown over some of it. It's not pretty the last few weeks. But reversion is going to be the long-term answer on it. If we move on, um, that's the sort of country we're looking at. So I suspect that some um, planting some indigenous on that may help. But those steep bony slopes 
afforestation on that with any um, plantation species is just a real no-no. And, um, and you certainly wouldn't get the forestation consent to do anything on that now. So reversion, but at the bottom of the hill, we still have the tow being captured by the, the Mata River and the Mata River. Well, I took out a major bridge that when you stand on it, it's 20 feet down to the to the flow. Um, so those outside bends are still a major problem. Just moving on, we'll just go over. And so that's also in this area. So this piece here, that was going to be put into plantation species, just like the piece above it. No one wants to log the piece above. It's a real a real legacy problem now. Um, Monica is about all it's growing on the other stuff. There's poles gone down the hill at a certain distance. But that stuff there is so active, so very severe gullying. Um, very badly eroded class seven, and you know, there's this expectation we're going to get effective tree cover on it. And a lot of that we consider is untreatable, and um, people have had a crack with planting barnica on land immediately adjoining it. Once again, it becomes a very high cost with a very high risk. So, yeah, not not that helpful. So that's some of the issues we've got, and unfortunately, we've got a bit more of it now. Um, and we've got quite a lot of land where we've had trees, pine trees collapse from top to bottom on the slope. So yeah, that's about us for the time being. But uh, Adrian, we really like to yeah perhaps get some of the um, some of the things we have to put our minds to now going forward. Um, but to me, most of our problems here come back to how well we've treated gullies and stream bank erosion and just how we need to go forward. This one here, really difficult. But on a lot of sites, there could have been a, a different approach. We could have had a lot more success in some of the gully sites with particularly poplar and willow planting. One of the things that has been a standout on our bit of country, the poplar and willow trees that are established have hung on really, really well. And um, there's certainly a lesson in that. Uh, ironically, after Cyclone Bowler, sort of the, the assistance on planting poplar and willow and Throughout our region, the, the assistance fell right off. There was a complete focus on uh, plantation species, close spacing, forestry, but with no concept of dealing with the gullies. And um, so we're left with some real problems there. So, yeah, um, yeah, that's about us. We're going to get booted out of this room any minute. So, um, yeah, no more than happy. anyone wants to send us an email, anything they've seen, there's plenty yeah. we don't like. So, there's going to be quite a lot that people are saying, you know, what. What are we trying to do with this? Yeah, so a big thank you to Kerry, Enrique, and and Bryce for putting these together. Um, I think there's a great opportunity for us to you know um, have another go at this um, later on in the series. Um, this the webinars are all being videoed and just talking. We were going to wait until the new Enzob website came up to put them on, but I think we're going to put them on the old website because I think the information's too relevant at the moment not to have available for people to look at. So. We'll look to do that in the next week or so, but um, no, um, very topical at the moment and be really great to have you come back, Kerry, and uh, show us in a few months time when you've been able to assess the damage and how effective some of the mitigations around the edges have actually been um, in um, um, Gabrielle, not been as bad as what it could have been, even though she was pretty bad, but um, and I'm sure there's going to be some successes in there for you as well. Mm -hmm. um, as, as well as some areas where you say, well, no, probably don't think was actually going to stop that at the end of the day. So on behalf of the um, people online, thank you very much um, for coming along. And, and thank you, Kerry and guys, for um, putting this together for us. One of the things that everyone's losing sight of here is that we're quite happy to have the protection of forestry on a bit of country over the last 20, 25 years. And um, it's that has held on pretty well in probably 80% of sites, mature forests, uh, might even be higher than that. And um, we would have had a lot more sediment without that. And it's not getting much credit, but we need to focus more on getting the right tree in the right place and getting plantation species out of areas that are really not plantation areas at all. So yeah, well, thanks, um, and I hope everyone's enjoyed this. It's um, a really interesting area here, and yeah, we're still going to get our share of problems to, to work away with. So, no, thank you very much. And uh, please look out for future webinars that will be coming along in the next month or so. Um, but thank you for joining us today.
Thank you. Thank you. Cheers.